All right. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for being here today. We're now over a month into the session, about a quarter of the way towards adjournment, and we had a good start with almost everyone in the building making it clear housing would be a top priority. After spending historic amounts over the past few years and still seeing a lack of housing in every county, there seems to be an understanding outside this building, and I believe in it as well, that it's time to focus on the regulatory side of the equation. We need to make it less expensive, faster and easier to build or renovate the housing we desperately need. That way, the investments we've made will go farther, but more importantly, incentivize the private sector who actually build much more housing than state government to invest and build more. On January 10th, I stood here with a tripartisan group of lawmakers and stakeholders to outline good, solid proposals that had wide support and I felt good about the odds of passing something meaningful. But one month into the session, not as confident as I was that day. It appears in some committees they're moving in the opposite direction. Instead of prioritizing how to produce more homes, which would address all kinds of issues like workforce, health care, property taxes, education, and more, some are looking to add to the regulatory burden and put us further behind. For example, <clears throat> House Energy and Environment is currently moving forward with a bill that, in my opinion, would be an economic disaster. And Senate's natural S-213 looks similar, creating new definitions, significantly expanding requirements and shifting responsibility for certain types of land use regulation for Vermont, uh, Vermont municipalities to a &R that will put Vermonters in jeopardy of violating laws they don't even know exist. As proposed, H667, H or 687, I'm sorry, will also dramatically expand Act 250 jurisdiction statewide. While it does include some Act 250 exemptions, they're narrow, stringent, and geographically limited, making nearly the entire state subject to Act 250. As most of us know, we have a housing crisis in all parts of Vermont not just in our cities. Leaving rural Vermont in our housing strategy is far from strategic, fair, or acceptable. And to be clear, I'm not proposing that we build on our mountaintops, develop forest land, or create sprawl. Our housing package focuses on designated areas within rural communities. To make my point, let me show you a couple of maps. This is the first. This is, uh, this is what currently triggers automatic Act 250 jurisdiction. As you can see, that's the yellow. And here's what would happen under the House proposal. That would be most of Vermont. Act 250 would be automatically extended to the areas indicated in red, orange, and yellow, which would cover over 75% of the state's land area and would be designated critical resource areas. That means if you want to build a single family home, or maybe even a garden shed, you'll need to go through Act 250, which we know adds cost and time. Under the House proposal, Act 250 jurisdiction would also be triggered if a proposed project was set back more than 500 feet from an existing road, or was part of a subdivision with more than four units. Put another way, as currently drafted, H-687 would render more than 90% of the state subject to automatic Act 250 jurisdiction. For perspective, currently less than 15% of the Vermont landscape falls under automatic Act 250 jurisdiction. I think most Vermonters would find this new bill totally unacceptable and hamper, not help, solve our housing crisis. As I said at the beginning of the session, the depth of the crisis we face demands bold action. But this bold action isn't what I had in mind and actually moves us in the wrong direction. So I want to be clear. I won't accept a housing bill that fails to meet the moment. Taking one step forward and one step back won't cut it. Taking two steps forward and one back won't cut it. 
we must jumpstart housing in all communities, period. That's going to take all the creative approaches in H719, including changes to Act 250, local zoning, appeals, and tax incentives for those who want to invest in communities. Here's the bottom line. We can't water this package down and expect to address our housing shortage. Now, I've been around this building long enough to know how this works. That's why I call it out in my state of the state and budget address. We cannot let a couple special interests and a couple committees block the progress we need to make. And I'm confident the vast majority of Vermonters agree with me. But I also think most legislators of both parties do as well. The folks back home elected them to solve problems, not create them. And just because you sit on a committee dealing with uh, another issue, it doesn't mean you can't make your voice heard on this one. Because the reality is, housing impacts many issues on other committees, from homelessness to health care to public safety and resiliency to education and workforce. So let's make progress on housing that we so desperately need to help our communities. And with that, open up to questions. Who are you referring to? I, I would say, for instance, right down the end of the street, the NRC. They've been integral in this, this process and uh, have hampered our progress. What do you think the motivation is there? They have their mission. It's part of their, their group, uh, a nonprofit. Uh, that, that's their, their mission is to, to protect the environment as best they possibly can. My, my um, mission is to make Vermont more affordable, create more housing, and make, make Vermont safer. So we have two different missions. When we talk about a new statewide Act 250 jurisdiction, I mean, what specific, like, is it Act 250, like, a new criteria, or is it just the, the area in which Act 250 is, is applied? Well, it's, it's, it's all, um, all in, incorporated into the bill. Um, it's, it's the whole revamp of Act 250. Yeah. Julie might be able to describe sure. it better. Um, so it, it is expanding areas um, where Act 250 jurisdiction applies. So in the, the map on the, the right-hand side there, those areas indicated in orange are above 2,500 feet, and that's automatic Act 250 jurisdiction. In H687, um, <clears throat> it lowers that threshold to 2,000, or that elevation threshold to 2,000 feet. It also creates what are called critical resource areas. Uh, that are defined by as prime ag soils, slopes in excess of 15%, river corridors, uh, wildlife connecting habitats, among other criteria, and also indicates automatic jurisdiction if you are more than 500 feet off of a road. And so collectively, it results in the red, orange, and yellow areas shown on the left-hand image. Is there like, any room for a grand bargain where you get 99% of the stuff that you want in areas that are suitable for development or that most people agree are suitable for development. And you give up the, the 90% of the state where there's probably not much of a chance for a ton of meaningful development anyway. Well, again, from the very beginning, we've all been talking about the housing crisis. How does the bill, how does this bill, particular bill, how does it help housing? I haven't seen where it's done anything help housing. So my first litmus test is how do we how do we make housing more affordable, faster, more units in place to get our work ourselves out, out of the situation we find ourselves in. And um, I, this bill just doesn't do it. What about the Senate bill? The the one I've seen, or at least it looks like it mirrors the House version. My, I'm talking about the, the Senate economic. 
Oh, home. yeah, H719 has a lot of good provisions in it. I mean, we all agreed with that, and, and it's still, I'm still supportive of that. Um, we'll see what they do with the Act 250 portions of that, but um, we'll have to see what, what happens when it gets through committee and goes over to natural resources. But as proposed, um, we were in, you know, 90% agreement with everything in there, not everything. Um, Halfway to Means appears to be landing on um, a response to some of the property tax issues that you've raised um, that involves eliminating this 5% buffer um, and extending how meeting day votes accordingly, however long districts need to put something, go back to the drawing board, put something back together. Your thoughts on what you what you've seen so far? As uh, as I understand it, there'll be like three phases to this. First phase is uh, making sure that they they take away the five percent cap, uh, which I think is a move in the right direction, uh, rectifying that. Uh, they're talking about extending uh, town meeting day, or I don't know if it's just the vote on school budgets or whether it's town meeting day itself. It's unclear to me, uh, but um, but I think that's. That's fine as well. Uh, I think if you might recall when I proposed something similar about seven, eight years ago, um, it wasn't well received. Uh, but, but I think this is uh, well timed to give people the opportunity, especially those who've crafted their budgets that have exceeded the 5% cap <clears throat> and um, they need to go back to the drawing board. So a couple of things as well with that. One. Um, if they, if they do this, this doesn't fix the problem. We're not going to come up with $225, $250 million worth of savings with this provision at best. I think we're looking at, at best, maybe 15 or $20 million, uh, of savings to do this. So there's still a long ways to go uh, in terms of um, the property tax increases we're going to see as a result. Um, the other piece of this is if we extend this, um, this, uh, this vote um, for whatever period of time, it's going to cause a lot of confusion, understandably. Uh, we have to support uh, the municipalities and the school districts and coming up with, uh, with new uh, ballots and so forth and then warning this. I think this is a this is a time when we should institute the mail-in ballots um, because you can't expect people, especially if it's not a set date, if it's sometime between uh, traditional uh, town meeting day and some other date, um, for every town to be consistent would be, uh, would be difficult. So I think uh, mail-in ballots is going to be essential. Fair to say that one reason you'd like to see mail-in ballots is because you think it would uh, compel voter participation among a swath of the electorate that might apply more scrutiny to those budget proposals? We've seen in the past where it's a limited number, an embarrassing number of people actually vote uh, in their town meeting day and, and school budgets and so forth. And I think this is a way, I think we've proven uh, that mail-in ballots increases participation. And I think in this uh, instance, people should weigh in. And do you think that uh, there's a greater chance that more budgets would be voted down if we did mail-in ballots? Well, it depends what they, what they do, the school boards do with their budgets, because they'd be going back, some of them would be going back to the drawing board, reflecting on this uh, situation we find ourselves in, and uh, maybe changing their budgets. So the legislature has a proposal right now. Um, you say it doesn't go far enough. What, what kind of proposal do you have that you think would more fully address the property tax issue that voters are contending with? Well, what, what I just said, though, was I believe what they do, they're doing is three phases. I'm, I'm supportive of what they're, what they're doing in the first phase. We haven't heard much about the second or third phase at this point, but that's going to evolve. So I wouldn't say I'm opposed to what they're doing. What more would you like to see? I mean, if you're putting this bill together, what do you want in there? I think we all have to be at the table. I mean, we've had um, suggestions in the past. I think that they have to reflect on those 
they have some of their own, as I said in the State of the State and the budget address. And we have to work together to find a way to reduce the amount of spending uh, for, uh, for our schools. And um, it's going to be tough, tough conversations, no doubt. You made suggestions in the past. What are, what are your suggestions right now? I put those back on the table. So right now? I've said that. I mean, so I'm not, not right now. I've, I've said with this phase two and phase three, we're at the table. We're ready, willing, and able. And uh, we want to be part of the solution as well. We're not putting all this on, on the legislature. We're saying we're here too. And uh, we'll be involved in whatever, whatever decisions they make if they, if they want us to be. And uh, we'll be part of, hopefully part of the solution. But you would, uh, nothing further that you would add as it relates to the school budgets that are going to be voted on this year, whether that's March or I think I think that's difficult at this point in time. Again, their approach right now uh, to to uh, to eliminate the five percent cap um, provision and um, and extending uh, the the voting on school budgets for a month or whatever period of time it ends up being is the right move. It seems that the House and the Senate have some reconciliation that they need to do on this, but in some way, shape, or form, there are proposals to extend the hotel to hotel program from June. Um, the House has a broader swath of people that they want to extend eligibility for. How, how are you feeling about that? I haven't seen um, I haven't seen the the budget uh, as passed out of committee uh, in the Senate at this point in time, so I can't really comment on it. I know. We were trying to get the information this morning, and I, I didn't see anything in writing. Maybe it's out now, but I, I haven't seen it. Do you think that the motel program should be extended through June, though, at least for some? It folks? depends on it depends on what it what it says, the actual verbiage. Um, so we'll see see what it says, and then I can comment further after we get a chance to look at it. Governor, this morning in Senate Judiciary, we heard some testimony from folks at the uh, Columbia, uh, Columbia University's Justice Lab um, showing that the Raise the Age initiative that the legislature passed and that you signed has, uh, we're seeing a, a smaller caseload, I think it's maybe how, how the, they put the data this morning. Um, some might say that kind of goes maybe an opposite of, of or against of what, what you painted earlier in your, your budget address, uh, you know, relating to crimes and delinquency among young offenders. What, have you seen this data, and what's your read on the situation? I, I haven't seen the data. I'm curious as to how far back they went, um, looking at, I believe, um, this was, if you look at the trajectory back maybe 10 years, uh, it has been dropping in some respects. Um, but a lot of that is probably due to our demographics. I don't know if they factored that in or not, but I'm sure one of the committee members asked that question. Your administration, and maybe Commissioner Winters can chime in on this if, if, you, if you'd like, but um, you're proposing to pause, raise the age again. We heard some concern from lawmakers this morning uh, about that. Why, why do you see the need to, to again, pause it? I think because, for, again, I don't think we're ready. Um, I don't think we were ready before. I signed it. I said that. Um, but, um, but I don't think we're ready for it. Uh, and I, I think we have to really take a step back and, and make sure we know what we're doing. We don't want to make the situation any worse than it is right now. Anything you want to add, Commissioner? Yes, Thank you, Governor. I think you hit on, on the key points. It's that um, there were some limitations in the data that the Columbia Justice Center uh, were able to look at, the publicly available data. What we are looking at as a department is the overall system and the strains that this would put on the system of care, uh, both from a child protection services standpoint and a juvenile justice standpoint. We have some of the same workers covering all of those cases, and uh, we have uh, some pretty high vacancy rates right now. We are working on the high-end system of care, but until that is in place, the system is going to remain strained and overworked. And as the governor said, we want to do this, but we want to do it in a way that we can implement it successfully, and we're just not in a position to do that right now. Well, what were the limitations, the way that you see it? What, what were those limitations in the data? Uh, the, the data looked at a couple of uh, three publicly available data points. Uh, I don't remember specifically what those were, 
but what we're looking at is the system as a whole. Um, some of the cases that both go into the, onto the criminal side and to the juvenile justice side, um, that they bounce back and forth, and so they do have an impact, even though they're not reflected in the data that the Justice Center was looking at. Um, and we gave some testimony this morning on that. Can you also talk a little bit, a little bit about the, I know it, you mentioned this morning, it's a couple of years out here, but a new potential facility, I think 10 or 12 beds maybe was the number that was floated to be placed somewhere in, in Chittenden County, was it? Can you talk a little bit about that, that proposal? Sure, we're looking at a permanent secure facility for uh, crisis stabilization for justice involved youth, for, for those, uh, those who need the highest amount of care, who might pose a danger to themselves or to others. Uh, that permanent secure facility is probably a couple of years out still. We're in the RFP process right now, looking at a, um, a few different sites, and uh, we'll have a decision on that in the coming months. And, and it is a 14-bed facility, I should say. Uh, I think it's um, six beds on the crisis stabilization side and then eight beds on the treatment side, so a longer term stay and, and more treatment in the secure facility there. We think that's the, the right size for our needs as a state. Actually, Commissioner, one more question. Um, you kind of mentioned somewhat earlier, going back into even before the session, when you heard about this Middlesex location, potentially January, we're now in February, I guess. When do you foresee that potentially coming online? Yeah, the, the Middlesex facility is something that we um, refurbished as a temporary solution until we get to the permanent facility that I was just previously mentioning. Uh, the construction is done, it's ready. Uh, we simply have to contract with a service provider. Uh, we're in conversations with a service provider but haven't, don't have anything on, uh, signed on the dotted line yet, but we should have that in the next, uh, next couple of weeks, I would expect. Thank you. What would you, um, what was, well, what's your, your, your thoughts on the renewable energy standard house bill that would require utilities to source 100% of their power from renewable sources by 2030? Um, again, I would probably refer to my commissioner. Is she on? She's not on. Um, maybe I can get Commissioner Tierney to, uh, to she's more, more in tune with with that than I am. I, I would just, I would just, big picture. I would say, the the quicker that we can get to renewables, the better. Um, but, um, but we we receive a lot from Canada now. I don't know the details of that, whether it's just in state or not. I want to make sure that we're including out of state uh, renewables as well. And uh, I think there's going to be a lot coming online in the near future, whether it's offshore wind, uh, maybe in the New England region, uh, and uh, in other areas as well. So uh, again, I just don't want to make electricity any more expensive than it is today. Uh, we need to, to be sure that we're taking care of uh, people and, uh, and our businesses as well, um, trying to foster that manufacturing sector uh, that relies on less expensive uh, electricity and they're paying a premium for it now. So if this can provide for uh, less expensive energy, less expensive electricity, then I'd be all for it. But I haven't seen the, the details. Uh, Governor, I have a couple budget questions. Uh, the state's attorney's office says seven to 25 new deputies will be needed to address the criminal justice backlog. Uh, I've heard your administration wants to actually cut nine deputy positions by vacancy. Um, will reducing these deputies impact the state's criminal justice response? Yeah, I'm not sure that uh, that's entirely the case. So uh, we're not looking to, to cut. I think we're using some of their vacancies as well. And I think that we have a discrepancy on the number of vacancies they have. So. Again, we'll look into the details and see what's uh, if we made a mistake, then we'll we'll rectify that. But but we think there's more vacancies in there, and they're talking about. Okay. Um, also, the legislature is talking about raising revenue, but we haven't heard an awful lot about reducing existing spending. Have you asked your agency or department heads to submit some uh, across the board, actual year-over-year -year budget cuts, like you know? everyone cuts 2% or something like that? I think in this uh, environment, uh, what we've asked, we've asked our, a lot of our 
agencies and departments uh, just to level fund, especially with the incredible inflation that we're seeing across the board and the higher costs of uh, insurance and, mm -hmm. and labor costs and so forth. So to produce a budget uh, that, um, that doesn't raise taxes in this environment, I think uh, they've done Yeoman's work in, in providing that. So very proud of uh, the effort on our part. Uh, but we'll see what happens as we move through. I, that's one of my concerns with the BAA. Uh, they're spending more than we had uh, we had anticipated. Uh, in fact, there's a finite amount of money, so whatever they spend over and above what we had proposed uh, will come out of the budget. So I look forward to understanding where they're going to get that money. Thank you. Speaking of you know big costs, we, we've talked about property taxes. One of the big underlying factors this year is health care costs. Um, you know, there's two big bills right now: the Medicaid expansion and also S211 dealing with the, the Green Mountain Care Board. Have, have you gotten a, a read on that bill? And, and what, what's your, have, your take? I have not. I have not see, seen the bill. I haven't reflected on it myself. What I guess what is your your take of, of where we are in the reform project? Green, you know more people into the all-payer model, flat, you know, uh, which... Yeah, I think we need, you know, I've always felt that we need to continue to focus on what we've been trying to accomplish over the last few years. Um, and I know it's difficult to see it through, um, but um, <clears throat> but this is something that's important uh, to, to at least anticipate uh, and not turning, uh, turning away uh, from uh, the, the path we're on at this point in time. So as I mentioned in my uh, budget address, uh, the AHID model uh, that the federal government is proposing, uh, I think shows some promise. It's, uh, it's state driven using many of the um, ideas across the country, uh, including Vermont. And so we'll continue to work with them and the Biden administration to, uh, to, to make that uh, better uh, for us. As well, but it's there's no doubt um, it's healthcare is very costly, just like everything else, and has been increasing. So we need to get a handle on this, and uh, and I think the model that we proposed uh, years ago, I, I think, will prove itself out in time. But it's going to take a long time. And then just the last, I mean, how how long do you think? I mean, that's been one of the big questions: is when will yeah. it show promise? Well, when we have a couple happen? things working against this. Our demographics being one. Uh, an older uh, population tends to use more health care uh, than a younger population. The younger population doesn't use it as much, but provides some of the payment uh, to, uh, to, to, to hold the whole thing together. And um, so we're, with our demographic shift, uh, we have an older population and we have fewer of our youth here, or fewer youth um, providing the basis for, uh, for the revenue. Uh, that we need for insurance. So we have both things working against us, but uh, this is a prevention model. When you take, uh, when you consider that, it takes almost a generation to get through that. It, you know, we're trying to, to prevent uh, people, trying to provide for better health and uh, prevent some of those high risk situations later in life. So that takes, takes a while uh, for it to come to fruition. Um, would it be accurate for me to say in a story that the governor says he supports um, mandatory growth caps on school budgets and uh, statutory limits on staff to student ratios in Vermont schools? I, we have we have proposed um, some of those some of those items. And we would propose them again, uh, because again, due to our demographics, we have fewer kids in the schools, and there's been a shift. Um, we have, you know, over the last 20, 30 years, we have 30,000 fewer kids in our schools. So uh, we have to. There's a day of reckoning, and we have to figure this out. So it would be a proposal we're pushing forward with, um, but. Um, but again, we don't have the magic wand. I still believe in local control. I still believe in school boards uh, having a uh, say in this as well, and the people and communities and supervisory districts having a say. So we can provide some parameters 
and, and provide, I think, uh, some direction. Um, but at the end of the day, it all comes down to voters. Um, you said we proposed those in the past, and we would propose them again. Well, you would propose them if what? Well, again, we, I've said uh, we've made a number of proposals over the last seven, eight years. Uh, they haven't been well received by the legislature, uh, but we still think they have merit, and we'll propose them again if they're interested. A few folks on the phones. We'll start with Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Uh, thanks, Jason. Um, Governor, there's been um, a, a bill to change how the Greenmont Care Board operates, and um, you just recently uh, um, installed a new uh, PUC chair, and I'm wondering if you see these regulatory boards changing in the future, um, whether you like it or not, and, and what you um, think will happen to them. Well, I do think... Or uh, should happen to them. Yeah. Well, it's a, a good question. The Green Mountain Care, Care Board was uh, created due to single payer. Uh, when that didn't come about, uh, we still had the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, before that, we had... Uh, uh, Bishka that uh, oversaw some of the budgets or all, oversaw all the budgets in, in the hospitals. So it's a question that, uh, that should be debated, I think, as to whether it's, we still have a need uh, for the Green Mountain Care Board and, and what changes uh, would, uh, should be made to make it even better if we keep the board. So I don't mind having the debate and uh, we'll see where we go from there. Um, Commissioners, do you see any changes now that uh, there's a new chair? Um, I don't know if there'll be any changes. I mean, they're a quasi-judicial board uh, that's supposed to be uh, regulating and overseeing the uh, uh, the energy sector. So I don't see that anything will change, but different personalities, and and um, hopefully we'll have better results for Vermont. Ratepayers. I think that's the point. We need to uh, to protect ratepayers and make sure that we have a, a system that um, that is conducive to to more affordability and growth here in Vermont. Do you see any one particular thing they could do to actually uh, make that happen? Um, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. Wouldn't want to say at this point in time. But, but I think that there are uh, areas where we would see that there would be uh, a way to protect ratepayers in the future. And we'll see. I mean, the, this uh, clean heat standard it will be a test case for that. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Governor. Back to the room. Governor, one of my readers suggested that since our, it seems like a lot of people are still working from home, a lot of state workers, uh, what, what is the vacancy rate in these buildings that are all around us, and could any of it be perhaps transitioned to housing? Um, fit up in, in many buildings would be um, very expensive uh, to turn something into housing. Uh, we are uh, constantly trying to find the sweet spot, so to speak, uh, between remote work and uh, in, in uh, work provisions. And there's, there's a bit of a shift um, both back and forth. Uh, I think that uh, during, uh, certainly during the pandemic, it was uh, a lifesaver for us uh, to continue with the government services uh, with people working at home. Many people have continued in that respect, but some are coming back. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to, I think we have to reflect on this over the next uh, couple of years uh, to see where we go. But we, we are constantly looking for, for ways uh, to make uh, state government more efficient. And uh, if it means that more people are working from home and we can free up space and, and maybe uh, sell some of the space uh, to someone who could, could make it into something else, whether it's uh, affordable housing or housing in general or, or business or whatever, uh, we would be amenable to that. Thank you. Um, one more time on property taxes. 
Um, it feels like you're playing more of a passive role in this debate right now. Do you think that's a fair characterization? Well, I think it's a realistic role. I mean, we've seen over the last, certainly over the last two years, um, they hold all the cards, the legislature does. They can do anything they want. They don't need me one way or the other. They've said that, and they've, they've proven that. Um, I've said we will play a role. We will be part of the solution. We're willing to work with you. But there has to be a desire for that. Otherwise, it's in their hands. I mean, they've proven that. So I don't know what else to say. We've tried the other approach. Um, over the last seven or eight years, we brought, brought things forward for them to consider, and they were just rejected out of hand. So we'll do, we'll do whatever we can to help. I understand they've been keeping you in the loop on what they're working in the ways and means right now. But there are conversations ongoing between members of your administration and the legislature as it relates to that bill. Um, why is? I mean, to, to what extent does that represent the kind of collaboration that you're looking for to, to get to a point where you, I guess, feel comfortable putting an idea on the table and calling it an active proposal? Well, we have put, again, we put many proposals on the table over the years. Um, they could still be considered, uh, but we're willing to, to be creative and come up with other, others as well. And having a, a healthy dialogue, I think, is important. So a passive approach uh, might be, we're here if you need us. Uh, and, uh, and we're willing to help if that's passive. But we can't force them to do anything. We've, we've tried that approach, and it didn't work. So we're in the, we're in the situation we're in. Uh, they have the supermajority, and they can, they can do what they want. on the administration's search for a permanent secretary of education? I am going through those uh, as we speak. I, I've, um, I interviewed one yesterday, so I have a couple more to go. Were they good? Um, they're all good. Any ETA on that? Um, stay tuned. I mean, we, we know we want to make a, a decision as soon as we possibly can. The House recently passed a bill which would prohibit uh, discrimination based on hair types and styles. I'm wondering if you've read the bill and what you make of it. Um, again, I, uh, my focus has been on making Vermont more affordable and housing needs and so forth. Um, and and it, this bill is important. Uh, it sounds as though it's not controversial. Um, we'll see, uh, again, We'll reflect on that, but I, when it gets to my desk, it's probably something I would sign. What do you think about a 32-hour work week? <laughs> <laughs> that would mean you'd have to work longer, though, Calvin. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you're asking? <laughs> Earlier this year, establishing a 32-hour work week in Vermont. Just wonder if you'd seen it yet. I haven't. I've heard uh, some about that. Um, I I do think, you know, some of the the longer work days and less days, I think, is something unique and has seemed to work for many people. And uh, we, in fact, in corrections, we're we're using that strategy, and it's been been effective, and they seem to appreciate that having. You know, three days off um, is, is important, but they work longer, longer hours uh, during the other four days. So we'll see, I think, again, that, um, that employers uh, need to look at different strategies uh, to find qualified help and draw more people in and uh, have a chance for people to enjoy the outdoors and everything Vermont has to offer. So I think, uh, I think employers are looking at different approaches to attracting more people, and that could be one of them. You okay, Calvin? That was a sick burn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> uh, back to some of the raise the age discussion in Secretary <coughs> Judd this morning and Secretary Winters, if you want to jump back in, it was after you left the room that this came up, the 
committee seemed to be voicing some frustration over what they perceived as the administration asking to put off implementing raising age year after year and saying over and over that they don't have the resources to implement it. And it almost sounded like they wanted to play a game of chicken and say, we're going to implement it this year and call your bluff. And if you need more money, then we'll pass more money in the budget. What do you make of that? I wouldn't say that approach is any different than I've seen over the last few years. Thank you all.